Yes, I, I first met Brian Jefferson seven years ago, uh, and at that stage he was a man who didn't really know where to turn. Around about 2005-2006, I was, had really bad lower back pain. Um, trips to the doctors, it was every couple of weeks, and tried all different painkillers and everything. And so as a lawyer, um, the immediate thought uh, is that spinal cases are difficult, neurological cases are very difficult. Uh, and there was an immediate warning sign in Brian's case, which was that the surgery was about three years ago. I rang a solicitor, one of the sort of well-named ones, I think it was in the Leeds area. And the, I explained to him what had happened. At first, they seemed quite interested and said, yeah, you may have a case. And then a couple of days later, they phoned me back and said, well, I'm sorry, but we're unable to take your case on. The interesting thing about Brian's case was that it evolved over time. Um, what began as a concern about time frames over several years turned into a concern about the actual surgery itself and the approach that the surgeon had taken. I was quite amazed going through the process because my part was easy. Um, I just had to explain what had, what had happened and how I felt and the effects it had on me. And, um, the solicitors did all the rest for me. They 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 did all the um, all the um, challenging the other side and and saying, look, this is what we feel you've gone wrong on and what you have and haven't done. And uh, and the first the first step in any case is to is to obtain the records of what's happened. Uh, so we got hold of his medical records. We got hold of the scanning that had been done. And the picture started to emerge about what had happened. He'd had an MRI scan before the surgery, which showed that he had uh, a protruding disc in the thoracic area of his, of his spine. It was a T9 disc that was sticking out. Uh, and in some ways, he'd been very lucky because the surgeon uh, that, that he'd seen in Leeds was a well-known neurosurgical expert. Uh, and so he'd had one of the top men in the field. Uh, this didn't make our life any easier because in, uh, in medical negligence cases, the test for when somebody is being negligent is whether they've acted with a, a reasonable level of care and skill defined by the standards of the profession. So we were dealing with a top man here um, and the argument was always going to be that he'd fallen below an acceptable standard of, of neurosurgeons. The next step in our investigation was to widen the case and, and look for more expert evidence. Medical negligence cases are won and lost on expert evidence. On expert evidence. Uh, judges want to hear from doctors about what doctors might have done wrong. The disc that was protruding and, and causing the original problem that Brian had uh, was, it was a large calcified disc that was right in the middle um, of the, the spinal canal. Um, the surgeon who operated on Brian did what he'd done in about 20 other cases involving thoracic disc protrusions and he'd gone in from the back and from the side. And that works if the disc is protruding laterally, so if this is a disc protrusion to one side and impinging on one side of the spinal cord because you can get to the disc, gradually remove the calcified disc tissue without having to move the spinal cord out of the way. But when you've got a central calcified disc prolapse, our neurosurgeon said that most surgeons at that stage would take an approach that goes in from the front because that way they get to the disc and they haven't got the problem that the, the cord, which is quite fluid, comes round into the surgical field. And so the second theory in our case was that by going in from the wrong direction, the neurosurgeon had caused unnecessary pressure and damage to, to Brian's spinal cord. And that, of course, got rid of the problem that there was this immediate onset of symptoms um, because if you directly cause trauma to the spinal cord, that happens immediately. That would be consistent with Brian waking up with the neurological deficit in his legs. Um, 
it worked out, so it paid off for me because you know I got compensation in the end. So the difference for me was that I could much more better quality of life. I've got I've got funds if I need pieces of equipment. So what we did in, in Brian's case was to employ a case manager to help him try different sorts of equipment. We had uh, a representative from a company that builds all-terrain wheelchairs go around with some models for him to try. We were able to get him a weekly slot at a uh, hydrotherapy pool, which he absolutely loved. Um, he said that you know, that took away, the, took away the pain and the spasms in his legs right into the night, so he could get a decent night's sleep after a visit to the hydrotherapy pool. Damages claims are also about independence. Now, Brian doesn't have to rely on his family to do things for him and to look after him. So he's got the he's got the independence to be self reliant. However willingly they they looked after him, however happy they were to do that, he doesn't need to call on them now. If I hadn't gone to Ben and expressed solicitors, I wouldn't have got that far, because nobody else was willing to take my case on.